Presbyterian Church. It's a joy to be with you this morning, to be gathered with God's people on this gray morning. It's supposed to clear up, I believe, but on this gray morning, worshiping with you, rejoicing that Jesus is the light of the world. To be with his people and declare that we need him in our darkness, that we haven't always walked in the light this week, and thus to hear the good news of his forgiveness and love, and to be reminded that it's not about us, our striving, our succeeding or failing. It is a story about the light coming into the darkness and drawing us into his love and life. So welcome. I remind you, uh, there are the things just to remind you at this worship space, since we've been moving around for how long now? But uh, bathrooms are downstairs, um, through a little door, and underneath kind of this side of the, the room underneath us. There are worship guides printed back there. You will need those throughout the service. Um, other things we'll announce later, but I think that's, that's mostly it. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with a moment of silence, and then um, Jim will come lead us. Let us stand for our call to worship. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. We are to rescue from our enemies so we can serve God without fear. Because of God's mercy, tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Come, let us worship and rejoice. Let us pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come this morning contemplating our Savior's coming. We're reminded to ask, where are you from? 
and we see a human genealogy, a babe born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, the family uh, of, of tradesmen, born of Mary. But Jesus, we know and are told that you are also from heaven, born of the Holy Spirit, being in the very nature God. He did not con consider equality with God something to be grasped onto, but he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this morning, Lord, we do bow and we do confess. You are our Lord Christ. You are our Savior. And you have brought God down to us, and he has brought us into the presence of God. And we now have a new genealogy, born again. We are now, by grace and the power of God, from heaven also. Amen. Amen. Shall return to the people of Israel. 
and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. We light this candle as a sign of our waiting and hope of the coming Christ, who is our prophet, priest, and king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As is our practice, uh, we will now uh, enter a time of confession, uh, which we all need to give to us, that God gives us. And so let us uh, join together. Lord, you were born to be our king, for you are Lord of all and reign as king of kings. We, we confess, confess that we have thought much more about our own kingdoms than about yours. We have acted like the kings and queens over our own lives, and we have not regarded your reign nearly as much as we ought. We have not accepted your dealings with us as good, and have disputed with you and resisted your will. Gentle King of glory, have mercy on us. Let's silently confess to the Lord. comfort and assurance of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters through his blood. We have died together. We will rise together. We will live together. Do you renounce the sinful desires that would separate you from God and from his people? We do. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world that corrupt and destroy his good creation? We do. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? We do. Let us rise in body or in spirit and hear the good news of the gospel. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things which we had done, but because of his mercy. He, he saved, saved us through the washing of rebirth and, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. His grace made us right with God. So, so now we have received the hope of eternal life as God's children. What is the good news of this Advent season? Christ, Christ who came among us in great humility, saves, saves us from our sin, and offers us new life. And now the peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us extend that peace to one another. Peace. Peace be with you at home. Peace. Also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I didn't work. I can hit the thing, but I'm afraid it will kick us off. Are you moving around or are you just...
may be seated. I love that song as an Advent song. I remind you that in Advent we are preparing for the coming at Christmas, but also the second coming. So if you think about it, God has given us his son the first time, but then we will stand in glory sometime soon, we are told. Amen. Well, as we continue to worship, we continue to worship with the giving of God's tithes, our offerings. You can do that in a tin back there, or you can do it online. But as is our custom, we have had in this Advent season a prayer to give ourselves. So, um, as we especially want to give ourselves. Join me. Gracious Thank God, this Advent season, we watch in joy and, and we give in joy. We give you our offerings and our very selves. Use them to bring your love to the world. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you of things going on in the life of our family. Let me find the list for one. Today we have uh, third through fifth grade. They have promised our meteorologists that this fog will clear. So third through fifth graders, um, you will be in my backyard for hot dogs around the fire. So looking forward to being with you. Um, it, we'll do that at noon so that I can clean up and get there. Uh, Thursday prayer this week and the following week will be canceled. In light of the holidays, we're just going to sleep in a little bit. You pray on your own, of course, but corporate prayer um, will be canceled. Next Sunday's worship service, I want to give you this heads up. And that is, um, in light of just how many of us will be visiting with people this week, um, and people will be coming in from other places. Next week's worship service could be the time when our country could see spikes with Omicron. So what we are going to do in here next week is open the windows for better ventilation. So we want you to know that because you will probably want long johns. It will still be warmer than being out under the pavilion, but you will want a coat probably with you, maybe even bring blankets to share in case someone doesn't get the memo. We're going to Make sure we send it out this week to remind you, but the windows will be open for better ventilation So just be aware of that next Sunday. and We'll be taking a little step of extra precaution um, Fourth um, We often talk about our campus ministry But I've never had one of our campus ministers send us a brochure on what he's doing especially here at the end of the year Ben Spivey I'm on his care team. He's at Liberty University um, helping to bring the gospel of grace to uh, to that to that school. Um, he also is one of our campus ministers that in light of being at a Christian school struggles the most with financial assistance. So he sent this and said, just put them out. If anybody has a heart for Liberty or uh, has a connection to Liberty, perhaps they would want to pass this on to someone they know who would want to partner with our ministry. I have, uh, I think four more in this one. So if you're interested, grab it off the table, his, his brochure that's there. And then finally, we sent the midweek check-in with information on this, but I want to reiterate our Christmas Eve service. And that is, it will be outdoor at, at uh, Judy and Lou's house, or as I often slip and say, Jew and Ludies, but um, as I think many of us do. Anyway, that address is in the emails if you need it, uh, email the office. Um, it will be, a, just to remind you, it's an outdoor service, so it's all of our common things that we've done the last year. Bundle up for Jesus, bring your own chair, um, layer. Uh, if you have relatives and need chairs, let us know. We can send that out if you have relatives in, in and you don't have enough chairs for that or you need even extra blankets um, and those things. And then as we stressed in that email, um, please arrive early. If, for those of you that came for the bonfire, many of you did, as you know, we kind of drove through where we had the bonfire to park. That's where we're going to sit for the service. So you'll be, if you come late, you'll be driving through where people are sitting. So please arrive by 5 to help with that. At 4.45, we will have hot cider out. So come early, grab some cider, fellowship with people, and visit for a little bit, get your chairs set up. Um, but at 5 o'clock, the gate will close coming through the corral there, and you'll have to park on the driveway if you're running late. We understand. We won't give you the stink eye if you're running late, that some people do. But, um, but also, you will just need to find your way farther up toward the house and park up on the driveway there and then make your way back to us um there will be no zoom just because the signal doesn't work well out there we didn't want that frustration and then finally if the weather is uh, if it's inclement weather we'll be calling an audible as we often have done and we'll just send you emails and post it on the website about where we're going what we're doing okay i think that's it
Those are all the things in the life of our family this week. <laughs> Not all the things. Okay. Let's uh, pray. Um, here's some items I have, and I'm just going to ask people to take them. I sent out uh, in that midweek check-in an update as well on Virginia Ruth Davis. Um, those of you that have joined us in COVID might not know the Davises. They are still members of our family, but have moved to, to Waynesboro and want to connect over there because they have family there. But they're still members with us. Virginia Ruth was in a very bad car accident. And we want to continue praying for her recovery. Can I have someone who would volunteer to pray loudly for her this morning? Thank you, Beth. Obviously, um, we want to pray for, um, well, another update this week. Uh, Jim, I'm just going to ask you to pray quickly for this. Trinity, our mother church this week, we want to pray for our connected church. Their continued um, transitions and, and discerning, and you might know they're in this phase, but they had a third pastor in the last year this week offer his letter of resignation. So it's just, that's a hard time for a large church, and we are connected to them. So we want to pray for them. Um, we obviously, I'll, I'll finish with these things. We want to pray for continued recovery in Kentucky and in the Midwest where winds, these, these natural disasters, um, as well as COVID and this Omicron uh, stuff, and then our Christmas time. So I'll just, so we'll go Beth, Jim, and myself, okay? Lean into these prayers. Let's be God's people, taking our needs to him. Go ahead, Beth. Holy God, we lift up Virginia Ruth to you. This is an embodiment of a fear that all of us have as parents and children and brothers and sisters that someone would end up in a really, really bad accident. It happens quickly. In these moments, we know that our lives are fragile, that our lives are completely dependent on your grace. We ask for healing for Virginia Ruth. Yeah that you would restore her body to its proper function, quickly, fully. Protect her family from despair, from anger, from the wish to hate. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to speak to each of them in ways that they can see and understand and perceive. Let that be frequent, let it be often, let it be impossible to miss these and help us to know how we may hold them up and support them in this time lord we do lift up your church um, all across the land we want to specifically lift up our uh, our parent church uh, for us. lord i pray uh, for them for our church as it goes through uh, many transitions. It's a very difficult time on, in, for several different reasons. Uh, Lord, I want to pray that you will protect your church, Lord. I know that you're always working, and I pray that it will bring out a, a, a good ending to the story uh, that Trinity is involved in, to the journey they're involved in. I want to lift up the staff uh, that's remaining, Jesse as pastor, and uh, a number of the uh, elders and, and deacons, and just the the leadership of the church, Lord, that you will give strength and encouragement um, and give wisdom and insight and clarity about decisions. And Lord, grant courage um, that it takes to go through these, these times. I want to pray for the congregation in general, Lord. I pray that uh, their voices uh, will be heard. I also pray for uh, that you would quiet um, our hearts as a congregation. Lord, help us to uh, be faithful to the calling that you have given us, that uh, no matter what is going on, uh, we have a calling on us to minister to the people around us, uh, to help in times of, of need, and to reach out uh, to those who are in our community. Lord, help us to see the mission that you have given us for others. We pray this. And Lord, we pray for the staff that is leaving for a lot of different reasons or have left and the, and the journeys that they have and the, the positions that they have taken. Lord, I pray you will bless each one, that their ministries might be fruitful and the spirit might be strong as they work in, in the congregation where they are. Lord, we pray uh, for your goodness to be bestowed on us all. 
We pray for your blessings. You're so rich with those. We pray that we might respond to the correction and the disciplines that we have come to us as individuals and churches. And Lord, we pray most of all, have mercy. Lord, I agree. As we lift our eyes to our community and our nation, we ask that you would be kind and evident to all. Lord, this Christmas season, when people are using the very word Christmas with your name, Christ, in it, would you work in hearts? Would you give us opportunities to speak of your joy and your gospel? Would you Work in the lives of our neighbors. We often hear of Muslim countries having dreams. Would you even draw to your church in America this week those who need to know your love through dreams, through visions, or maybe through our words? We pray too, Lord, as we think of the needs around us of um, continued headlines of what happened in Kentucky and in the Midwest with um, winds that destroyed as well. We ask for your mercy, for the agencies working, for the comfort of those who grieve, please, and for um, the long road to recovery and rebuilding that you would give your hope, not just hope, <laughs> that you would work, please, in those areas. And finally, Father, we, I, yeah, I sigh, Lord, because we, we continue praying for our country with this virus, this pandemic, that there would be wisdom, that there would be healing, that there would be no unnecessary death, that you would please, Jesus, spare us and eradicate this, heal. Get us back to some kind of normalcy in it. Oh, Father, we do especially continue praying for the healthcare workers that we again see with this new spike from a variant, um, how overwhelmed they are, and how that's affecting other surgeries and people who are sick. Jesus, have mercy. Lord, again, we pray for this situation that you would strengthen those in hospitals and give them insight and wisdom. But, Father, our, we're looking to you in this because we... We are fearful, we are anxious, we have needs, yet we also trust. We are not so afraid in these uncertain times because we know you are good and you hold our future. So we ask that you would please work in goodness because that's our desire, but that you would please um, work out a good end to this. And Lord, in these prayers, we're asking for your kingdom to come. So it's been our habit in... Advent, we pray, as we look for the coming of your kingdom, we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's now give our attention to the New Testament lesson. The New Testament reading is from Matthew 2, 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks, Tim. Well, children, we have a 
One last gift that we're considering as we watch with people. So Laura's going to come for our children's sermon. Yeah. Do we have a gift next week? Yeah, there's oh. actually two more gifts. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? Come back to Sunday after Christmas, and there will be one more. Well, I know that um, many of you have a dog for a pet, don't you? What I would like to know is how many of you have a dog that you got from a rescue or a shelter of some kind? Let me see your hand. Look at that. It's wonderful. Well, as you know, dogs end up at shelters for a lot of reasons. Sometimes they get lost and their owners can't be found and so they, they end up being taken into the shelter. Sometimes their owners just can't take care of them anymore and so they go to a shelter. Sometimes they're hurt or sick and they need to be taken care of by a veterinarian and so they end up at a shelter for that. Well, we haven't had a dog for a while, so one thing our family started doing is fostering dogs from the animal shelter. And fostering means that you take a dog into your home for a little while to take care of it. Maybe while it's healing or while it's waiting for a family to adopt it. And, um, and so we would do that, and, but sometimes a shelter would tell me, you're gonna have a dog that's a little scared and you're gonna have to be patient with that dog because that dog had an owner that didn't know how to take care of it very well. And so they became scared and nervous because see, dogs know, they usually know who's in charge, don't they? They know that if they wanna eat, their owner's gonna have to give them some food and put some food out. Dogs know that if they wanna come inside where it's warm, their owner's gonna be the one that lets them interact. They know that if they feel sick or hurt, it's gonna be the owner that takes them somewhere to get better or gets them medicine. If they wanna snuggle, it's gonna be up to their owner to decide whether or not they're gonna snuggle with them. So dogs know who has the power, don't they? But you see, sometimes having an owner doesn't mean that they would be loved and cared for. Sometimes having an owner means that Someone has a lot of strength and power over them, but doesn't know how to tend to them and care for them. And so when I would get a dog like that, I would have to take a lot of time to show that dog that when I called it to come to me, it was gonna be okay. It could come to me without fear. That when I bent down to pet it or snuggle with it, it didn't have to be afraid that my touch would be gentle and loving. This was a dog that had to know and learn that it was possible to have an owner that would leave the house and come back in a really short time to be with it again and it wouldn't be left forever. They had to learn that an owner who had a lot of control and power over their life could also be kind and loving and gentle. And I know many of you have given dogs homes like that where they are learning to be cared for and loved and snuggled. Well, kings are like that. And we heard about two kings in our Bible passage this morning. There are kings that can have a lot of power and strength and authority and yet use that power to not take care of their people. And one of the kings that we heard about in our Bible passage this morning was named, does anyone remember hearing it? Herod. Herod was a pretty strong king. He was king over all the people when Jesus was born, but he was a king that used all that power to hurt instead of to love and to care. But the other king we heard about in our Bible passage, who was that? Anyone know? I'll give you a hint. He was born as a baby coming up this Saturday. Jesus, that's right. Jesus was the other king you read about. Isn't that funny to think about Jesus as a little king in a manger? But Jesus is God's best king. His most powerful king. But do you know what makes him the best king? <clears throat> it said that in our verse in Matthew. God said, I'm going to send you a ruler. A ruler who has all power and authority, stronger than any king that's ever come before. But guess what kind of king he's going to be? A shepherd king. And what does a shepherd do? A shepherd takes care of sheep. That's right. So when a sheep is lost, a shepherd goes out and finds it and brings it back. When a sheep is hurt, the shepherd puts it over his shoulders and carries it to be taken care of. A shepherd protects the sheep from all kinds of wild animals that want to hurt it. And God says, that is the kind of king that I am going to give you in Jesus. All powerful and tending to you 
like a shepherd cares for a little sheep. Well, let's see what our gift is going to be this morning. Who would like to who would like to come on up who hasn't had a turn yet? Sammy, why don't you come on up? All right, here, sweet girl. Let's turn around. Take that lid off. Pull it off. Pull it in and out. It's a little, I had to kind of shove it in there. So let me help you get it out because it gets a little bit stuck. What is that? Hold it up really high. A crown. A crown. You can hold on to that, sweetie. And we have crowns for everybody who would like them. You can go on and sit back down. Thank you, Sammy. You can take it. It's okay. <laughs> So everyone's going to get a crown this morning, but I wanted to just mention, the crown reminds us that Jesus has all power and authority, right? Your activity this week, children, if you do it at home, is to make a shepherd's staff. And that shepherd's staff is going to remind you that we have a very special kind of king who comes to us this Christmas. And that is a powerful king who cares for us like a shepherd. Come up and not leave me hanging here. <laughs> Also, I will mention that they're coming. I have more bottles, and I bought more glass teardrops because I needed them. And so if anyone who did not get a bottle um, and would like that, adults as well, please come get one from me, and I can, I can increase your supply of little glass beads as well. So. Continue singing as we love to do here at Hope. We want to invite Jesus to help us during this time of considering his word. So let's do that through this song. dismissed right now to go do your children's bulletin and activities and have fun with her. Boy, that's a great sound to hear, isn't it, as they rumble back. <laughs> Get this set. Here we go. Finish this phrase. Finish this phrase. Peanut butter and jelly, jelly came out first. Who has a weird way they finish that phrase? Anybody? This is, we'll do all the audience participation. Anybody have a favorite one they dare to admit? Jason? Pickles! Dill pickles? That's where I was going, but let's, let's push pause on that one. Anybody else got one? Mayonnaise. I have heard that's good. Is it really good? Yeah, I hear lots. There's a head shaking no behind you. Any others? Banana. Banana. That's a good one. It's pretty good. Nutella? I found a website that listed some. They had mayonnaise. Potato chips? Anybody tried this? Tuna? Oh. Yeah, that's, that was my response. Uh, but who am I to judge? I'm about to talk about peanut butter and pickle. Um, coleslaw? And then bacon? That actually sounds doable, because bacon's good with anything. Um, but yeah, my favorite, the way I immediately finish it, is peanut butter and dill pickle, which grosses a number of people out, but I love it. It's what I was raised on. My parents are listening, and, uh, and my mom's going, yep, that's what we were raised on. I love peanut butter and dill pickle. But yeah, even as you hear that, there are some who are like, uh, no, thank you. Todd, uh, you know, when you come to crave uh, peanut butter, and you think peanut butter and dill pickle, I go, that's great, uh, but not for me. <laughs> you may desire it, but I don't. I, I understand this longing for a sandwich or hunger. There's aspects of it. I go, okay, but I, I don't share your hunger for this thing. 
We're starting here because as we come to consider this fourth topic in our Advent season, Jesus being our King, I think it's similar to hearing about the different ways people crave for odd things with peanut butter. I go, okay, I'm not so sure, but that kind of, I could maybe see it. It's one of the hardest areas, I think, for us really to get under, for a, a long variety of reasons. We've talked so far about what are God's people, what were they watching for, and in light of that, what should we, as we continue to learn from them and think about our lives and long for our coming king, again, be longing for, as he is the anointed one, the prophet, the priest, and now the king. But it is this fourth one, I think, that we kind of go, it sounds a little bit like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> I mean, peanut butter and pickle as opposed to peanut butter and jelly. That, that, that we're glad for it. We will sing the songs this week and, and the next two weeks in the Christmas season for, for the Christmas themes of Jesus being our king. But when we really stop and think about it, it's a distant night. We do not crave it the way God's people in this passage craved. Just like you don't crave peanut butter and pickle the way I crave peanut butter and pickle. You don't crave for him to be your king because we sit in America, right? There's a variety of reasons here where we throw off tyrants. But that means we need to pause and think about this fourth aspect. We need to consider, drill down, and that's what we're going to do. I want to organize our thoughts as we think about Jesus being our king under three uh, headings. And they're going to be our lament, our location, and our longing. Our lament, our location, and our longing. Okay, I did the L literations and I forced them in, but for you note takers, that's where we're going. First, our lament. Kids, what, what is our students, now that we've got many kids back there, what is a lament? It's when you cry and grieve over a situation, when you have an unhappiness about something, discomfort even. And that's again where I might be pushing you right away, I'm jumping in to assuming that you go, oh yeah, I get that. Because singing songs about glory to the newborn king this week, right? And in the weeks to come. But think about it. We, as again, I mentioned, overthrow tyrants. We, if we're honest, don't like tyrants. We have a little bit of sorrow when we consider the fact that there are kings and that God is our king. What do I mean? First, how do we see it in the passage? Look at this. Here's where I want us to consider. Verse 1. Keep that passage out in front of you. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in, doesn't give us a date, the days of Herod the king. Now, that's a simple little phrase. We go, that's kind of how they did time marking. But I love the way uh, one commentator wrote it. He said, Jesus was born into Herod's time. But it's not Herod's. However, rulers assume that they determine the story that constitutes time. That time is determined by power. But then this commentator went on to explain that it's not just Herod who felt this way, but especially 21st century America. We think our time is of our own making. Right? I control my day. I am master of my domain. I can affect the income, and you don't tell me what to do. This is the pride of our human hearts, especially in America. I'm an independent, free thinker. And so it's as a result of that that we have to make, that's where we start coming to this idea of a king, that there's someone ruling over us, we push back against it. We lament this idea. It's why in verse 3, it goes on to say, when Herod the king heard of this news, as the, the Magi had come and declared that there's a king born of the Jews, it says he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. A lot of ink is spilt on, on what, what's, what's this mean? Why is this phrase in here? What's it mean that all of Jerusalem joined in being troubled? Shouldn't they have rejoiced? And there's no clear answer as to why Matthew wrote that, but one is I think it causes us to pause. And as we ask, why would they be troubled? To realize this point of going, oh, maybe I'm actually a little more troubled about it than I care to admit. That there's a little bit 
of hating people who rule over us. Why, why would we go there? Well, it is, is it not, let's put this in our largest story that we always remind ourselves of, is this not the lie of Genesis 3? <laughs> that you can throw off the rulership of God, that you know better, that you know what's best and can determine your future for goodness, for happiness, for wholeness. And yet we come to the place of, of verses in the Bible that tell us God's ways are not our ways. That God is in control. And isn't there a lot in your life that you lament? That you go, Lord, I thought I made plans going this way and now we're here. I thought I had time for this and now we're... And, and you realize I'm not as in control as independent, as on my own, as I create this mirage in American 21st century life. <clears throat> Again, with things going on in the, the life of our sister church that I'm connected with, there was a letter that went out this week. And, and some of you remember Jesse, who has preached for us here, who hopefully will preach for us again, uh, it, the, the pastor that's at Trinity, and, and he has uh, cerebral palsy. So he's wrestled. He wrote this in his letter, and I just thought it was a great illustration of what we're talking with. He wrote, I have wrestled with the sovereignty of God throughout my life. The sovereignty, right? Being a sovereign. That he is the ruler, I am not. So I have wrestled with the sovereignty of God throughout my life. As a teenager struggling with the physical disability, my questions to God were often, why me? Why this disability? Why couldn't I play the sports that I loved? The wrestling is not over doctrine. The scriptures clearly portray our God as sovereign over all things. Rather, this wrestling is struggling to surrender my heart to your will be done. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, Romans 8, 28. It's a wrestling sanctioned by our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Isn't that a great phrase? It is a wrestling sanctioned by our Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he goes on, and in the Psalms. <laughs> These lament psalms. That God welcomes us to come with our lament. But in that, what are we wrestling with? To identify that he is king and we are not. And we just want to start us there. Because that's where this starts. The days of Herod. How much does my heart sing? In the days of Todd. Today, this week, I have plans in the days of Todd, but I don't know what they are. And there will be a tension in them, and that is where we walk and live. But Christians know this wrestle is okay, and that we learn to be honest and submit and relate to a God who is sovereign. George MacDonald said, wrote, the central conviction of hell is that I am my own. And that makes sense. Take that central conviction into your marriage. How's it go? It's hell. <laughs> Take that central conviction into your family. How's it go? It's hell on earth, right? Take that conviction into your job. It's about me. It's I am my own. No. And yet, when we wake up, it is the hard drive of my heart boots up saying that. I am my own. I am independent. And Christians come along and say, wait a second, the Apostle Paul said to us in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 6, we are not our own. We are bought with a price. And so maybe the better word would have been wrestle, but I needed an L, so I put it as lament. Lament, that's where we start. Lament, second, our location, our location. But by that is, where, where am I? Where do I find myself? I find myself in this odd place of a tension between two rulers. Isn't that the odd place this passage presents? In the days of Herod, the king. And then it goes on in verse 3, Herod, the king. And he gives a question, and it's, you have this feeling like, don't you just see kind of these religious leaders going, yes, King Herod, yes, King Herod, right? He has authority. He has power. And yet... What happens in verse 2? I just love that the Magi, these guys from the East show up, and they, they don't just go, hey, is it true? Perhaps has a king been born of the king of the Jews? No. They declare, matter of fact, point blank, and that's partly why Herod and all his power is threatened, right? There is a new king in town. 
And so they say, where is he who was born king of the Jews? And that is, that is the theme of Matthew. It begins with the statement, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And then in chapter 3, John says, behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, Jesus' first words, the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent. You see these parables of the kingdom. And how's Matthew end? With Jesus standing on a mountain saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. We have King Jesus. It is declared. And yet, what's our location? King Herod is here. So there's this odd tension between the two. And what this reminds us of is that there will always be people and things that want to exert power over us in this time of dual influence. Of both the influence of the kingdom of God, but influence of not. Christians throughout time have called this this, this influence of idolatry, but it first is just acknowledging the fact that we're all we all need to sing along with Bob Dylan, right? That you got to serve somebody. <laughs> that you are serving somebody. And that there are other, it's not as easy as going, oh yeah, Jesus is my king. But there's work to be done going, no, really? Really, who am I serving? And that's this work of, of, of what, again, Christians have often called looking at idolatry. Not that I bow down to a wooden idol or to, uh, to some kind of carved stone, but that in my heart, there are other things that are ruling and influencing and controlling me in ways that I don't want to admit and that I'm actually blind to. There are lesser kings in our lives. And so we talk about this often. We can talk more at times, but I'll just highlight a few just for examples again. That remember, we come along and we say, you know, if, if there's any must, I must have this for the good life. It can easily become a rival, influence, power, king. I must have, uh, you know, I must work hard at life. I must work and perform at my job. And so I become a workaholic. It becomes too important. I must have obedient children. And so all of a sudden anger creeps in, right? Or envy or all the other places that it can go. I must have a good marriage. And so all of a sudden, it's the thing that's keeping me awake, and I get into a manipulation or, or however communication or these, this demandedness I must be thought well of. And so I, I try to perform well. I try to uh, I end up having bad boundaries, maybe, or I lie to create a false perception of me. I too often look at the lies and don't look at the fact that I have a king underneath that of performance. Or all these various things. I have to be good. And so we can become spiritual in a way that's not Christian. That right, all of these things, looking at false affections, false rulers, that we start allowing to influence us without acknowledging or even knowing it. And so Christians have realized that their hearts are idol factories and that they're always vigilant people identifying rooting out and repenting of the various kings in their life. And not only that, I, I want to drill down just one other place here. I was thinking this week, I was, I was thinking about how Christians also become vigilant, not just on what's going on in my habits of the heart, or like my views of things with idols, but in my very habits. <laughs> that Christians ask, what are the habits that start forming me in ways I don't know? What do I mean by that? There was a commercial. I, I was searching for some stuff this week on YouTube. Found this. The Michelob Ultra. They were called. They did a number of them. Swipe commercials. I don't know if you saw this. A guy walks out of his office. It was 2011, I think. So it's a little old. But uh, he wipes out, walks out of his office. And there's this lame little car. Kind of looks like my Corolla sitting right there. And, and he's in this big city. It looks like New York. And he wants adventure. He swipes right. And all of a sudden, there's a, a bicycle. And he hops on and you see him riding through as this urban, you know, guy swerving in and out. He wanted excitement, right? And he got it by getting a bicycle instead of this boring car. Well, then it goes to he's sitting in his cubicle up on the 30th floor. And he's looking at just these cubicle walls up, you know, eight feet high. It looks like, what's he do? He does this now. And he expands right in front of his cubicle. And you know what? 
He's sitting at a window office on the 30th floor with this great view of the city behind, uh, below him. Well, then the next, this is all in 30 seconds. The next 10 second scene, he's on the golf course and he's with his three friends and they're there and he puts this long putt and it drops and they're all like, yay. Well, you know what he does? He taps and immediately on the side of the green, you see this thing spin around that just appears and it's the bar from the clubhouse. They didn't even have to walk in to the bar. It comes to them. What's my point? We go, well, that's just a commercial, you know, that's kind of make-believe. But their ad executives are much more smart and comment on our culture way more than we realize they do and comment on our hearts. So here's what James K. Smith says about that. These creatives, advertising agents, are not stupid. They know that our phones are egoism engines. He continues, by spending an hour on our phones, we slowly learn. All of a sudden, everything we want is on our terms, and everything we want is at the touch of our fingers. My phone has subtly co-opted me into a vision of the good life and of the world that has taught me that I should never be bored, nor dissatisfied with anything, that there should never be a time when I'm not the center of attention. The entire world should be available to me on my terms, end quote. What's my point? When I first got my first smartphone, I had no intention of imbibing this kind of stuff. I'm saying like, I wanna enter a world where I'm dissatisfied all the time. I wanna enter a world where I can be taught that I'm the center of attention all the time, where everything can be at my hand, right? But we are in that world now. And I want to say, oh, no, I'm an independent, free-thinking American. Guess what? I'm being influenced by rulers and powers that I'm not even aware of. That's what this passage is saying. Herods aren't just people who try and come with a club in power. They are shaping us away from loves of the king and from a kingdom-oriented life. And so Christians have always been vigilant at saying, I have King Jesus. What are the things shaping me besides him? Because I want his rule and his power over me. So we lament, but also knowing since that's where we live in this place of two rulers, that's our location. Finally, we want to talk about our long. Verse 4 announces, or verse 2, excuse me, as we said, announces the king. And then as it goes on, you know, Herod asks them to come. And Laura alluded to the fact that in verse 6, you get this quote, right? Look at our quote. It is Micah 5.2. We started with it, the, the, the crystal read for us. But interestingly, you don't have to do it now if you can't flip back and forth. Compare Micah 5.2 with what gets quoted here. And some things get changed which under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, um, the gospel writers and the New Testament writers often did that to get at the ideas and to fill in what these predictions were doing. But it's really interesting. There's a lot of ink spilled again on how does he kind of, Matthew as a writer, elaborate on 5.2. But one of the things I want to highlight is that our last phrase that Laura said, where this says, who will shepherd my people Israel, 5.2 and Micah finishes, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. But again, do you see what Matthew is doing? After living his life, becoming a disciple of Jesus, years later after the death and resurrection, writing this down as he thinks, what is this promise? What is going on? As Micah has this ruler that is coming from ancient of days born, and he picks up this phrase, who will shepherd my people Israel. Guess what that's a quote from? 2 Samuel 5.2 where when Saul was being rejected and David was being called by Israel to be their king, what did Israel's people say? I know God, that we had Saul, but God has called you, and that he has always called you to be, and then it's this phrase, that he wants you to be the shepherd of his people Israel. Same phrase gets picked up. That Matthew is picking up this idea that remember the golden ages of our people? Because he's writing to Jews. Remember when life was good? Think of what James K. Smith said about the good life and these images we have. 
Do you remember what that was? We were under King David, and now his greater son, as we will sing about in our, our verses of Christmas carols, has come. And he has come how, as Laura talked about, as a shepherd, as one who will care for sheep that so easily go bah after this king and bah after that king. And he will love them to the point of dying on the cross for them. That he is our good king we've always longed for. And here's where I'll pick up some of the themes that Tim Keller uses. He talks about it in many different places, the fact that if you think about it, I just said our hearts long for it, and yet I started with our lament and go, we do we, do we, not really? This in-between times we're also longing. Think about the great stories. The great stories that always seem to go, there was a king, and there was a golden age, and it was wonderful, but the king is gone now. But somehow there will be a return. There will be a restoration. You can think of Robin Hood, right? Robin Hood is one. King Richard's away, but he is going to return. And Robin Hood's just battling in this time while they wait. But the great restoration is when King Richard shows up at the end. Sorry, spoiler alert. Or King Arthur in the round table. What, even as King Arthur passes away, what does his tombstone say? The once and future king. This expectation of the golden years of Camelot will come again. Or Lord of the Rings. Right? Lord of the Rings, this idea that the, there is this king, that there has been a golden age, but we've lost it, and he is out in the, the north, and he's hidden in the north, but he will show up in the hands, as he writes, Tolkien does, the hands of the king are the hands of a healer, and so shall the rightful king be known. And, and where I'm going with this is that all of these, and this is Keller again, I'm drawing from, he picks up, we have this longing, we love these stories, while you get up and look out the window and look at the world where kings and queens rule and their record is abysmal. We see tyrants. We see people using their power and enslaving people. And yet we still have this longing. And could it be that it's a longing we have because there is a good king that has come and that, as Keller calls it, we have this memory trace in our heart. This memory trace that there is a good king that we long for and that we can flourish under, that we can thrive under, who will come because he's a king who shepherds and loves and lays down his life for his sheep. What if there is that good king? Matthew says there is. His name is Jesus. Come to him. Fall in love with him. Don't just serve him. I almost used Psalm 2, because as you know, it's a coronation, as many of you know, coronation hymn, and I love the phrase that it ends with. It says, or that's in there, that says, kiss the son of David that's coming. That's what it's talking about. This affection that we are to have. Oh, wow, sorry. I went longer than I meant to. You may not like peanut butter and pickle. That's okay. You may not desire it, crave it like I do. But I pray that if we've, as we've paused here, and this week as we continue thinking about this, we crave a little bit more to sing with the people of God who were watching for their king. Glory to the newborn king. Glory to the newborn king. For he is our shepherd who loves us. Let's pray. Jesus. We give you glory and honor and praise for you have come. And as we enter this week of looking toward um, the celebration of your birth at Christmas, we continue asking that you would work in our longing, our lament, our um, hearts, and in our habits to be your people serving you. And all God's people saying, Amen. Amen. stand and sing as we prepare for the table.
come to this table where we remember our great shepherd giving up his life for his sheep. He did come in power to rule and to reign and to demand, but he came to serve, to give of himself, to bring flourishing to your life, soul, ultimate end through his work of obeying God perfectly and of dying to satisfy God's wrath and to secure God's love for you. If that is your faith, that Jesus is the light of the world who came for you as your loving shepherd and sacrificed himself for you. If that is your faith, come eat this meal that celebrates and gives us a picture of that reality. If that is not yet your faith, we're so glad that you're here. We're thrilled that you're here. But this is a meal of faith. And so if you don't yet believe that Jesus is your shepherd who has died for you, if you've not embraced him and not made that public by joining a church and being baptized, again, we're so glad you're here. But this is a meal of faith, so we ask you not to eat it. You can, there's no embarrassment in that. We understand that people are at various places of considering Jesus. But you can just keep your hands down while the rest of us uh, eat this meal together who do believe. Again, no oddity in that. But whether we're eating, whether we're sitting and not eating and just considering these things, or Jesus has given us this meal because he speaks to us in it. Not just 2,000 years ago does he speak, but he's here calling us to consider his great love as our shepherd. And so pray with me. We pause to thank you for this meal in prayer, Lord, because we don't want to just rush into it. You have kindly given it to us, and we pray that you now would encourage your people through it. Amen. I remind you of the words that were given to us in Scripture. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Join me in our final use of this uh, Advent communion response. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right for us to give, nope, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give thanks and praise. With joy we praise and thank you, gracious God. You sent Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior to bring freedom to the captives of sin and to establish justice for the oppressed. We, we rejoice, rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home, where we will sit at table with Christ our host. In unity with Christians everywhere, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Your death, O Christ, we proclaim. Your resurrection we affirm with joy. Your coming we await with hope. Glory be to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to again uh, distribute. We have two folks distributing. Keep your hands out if you are eating with us, representing your need for Christ. They will fill them. We will eat and drink together. If you need gluten-free, raise your hand and I will bring them to you.
of this being the flesh of our sacrifice, of our lamb slain for us. This flesh also represents our king, who did not in his power demand authority and worship, but gladly the king has sacrificed himself for his people. Eat, all of you, and rejoice. Our king has battled, our strong king has won, and our strong king is resurrected. He loves you and has given himself for you that you might have life this day. Drink, all of you. Amen. And in Advent, we will soon sing our king. So stand up, let's sing in joy. our first three responses, and then point up where Christ ascended with our last one. All our problems, we, we send, send to the cross, cross of Christ. Christ. All our difficulties, we, we send, send to the, the cross, cross of Christ. Christ. All the devil's works, we, we send, send to the, the cross, cross of Christ. Christ. And all our hopes, we, we set on the risen Christ. Christ. Stretch forth your hands to receive this good word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Send us out of here. Go forth in the name of Christ, remembering that he who came to the babe will come again at the end of time. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And we come singing our refrain for the week. Here we go. We watch for you, our strong. Merry Christmas.